Ross, thank you so much for your time. A week or so ago, you released this autobiography and then been on a nationwide tour. How's it been received, mate? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been really good. It's nice to um, obviously get some positive feedback, um, see see a few familiar faces around the traps, and to go to places, um, you know, around New Zealand that uh, I don't go and see um, by playing cricket. What has the reaction to what you've revealed been? And before I even say that, because you knew it would produce a reaction, and be and there are certain bits were going to be seized upon, because that's how the clickbait media works these days. Yeah, very much so. I think, um, you know, you're not really sure how things, because there's a lot of things in the book, um, good and bad. Um, But yeah, the clickbait, um, the racism, uh, the well-being, it's, you know, racism and well-being is very topical at the moment. Um, But yeah, the media just jumped on the the racism side. It's probably two or three pages in the book. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, it's nice to bring it to light, but I think it's definitely been blown out of proportion. And um, as you said, the clickbait. And um, but yeah, nothing's been made of well-being. I think we've seen with uh, different sports around the around the world and in New Zealand with um, a few high-profile incidents. Um, yeah, it's surprising that the media have gone in that direction and not not in uh, and maybe covering both. Well. Uh... You're such a nice guy, Ross. And I love you for it, mate. But I work in this stinky, shitty business, mate, and it's no surprise <laughs> at all to me that that's what they that's what they were going to focus on. And and I, I wanted to bring that up straight away because I wanted to sort of just establish that and, and mark it down and say, okay, that's three pages in the book. But this book covers your life, your career, and so much more. Yeah, I mean, um, it would be remiss of me not. Um to talk about it, uh, I guess the reaction and surprise um, from people, sort of, I guess, nice that I've I've talked about it. Uh, to think that people that it doesn't happen on a daily basis, um, you know, obviously he comes as a surprise to people. Um, but yeah, it's nice to bring it to light. Um, there's been a lot of positive conversations uh, following it, so um, I'm glad I talked about it. Ross Taylor with us on the platform. See, one of the things that I just find so uncomfortable in Icky Ross is that you know I'm I, I mean if you're if you're if you're white like me and you've you know you're sixth or seventh generation, it's just impossible to ever try and put yourself in someone else's headspace and experience what they feel from their eyes. And that's what I really liked about the way that you described it. It's you know you know you weren't in, you weren't in any way castigating anyone or calling them out. You just say, hey, look. You know, you got to understand that, that what you see and how you've been brought up and who you are is different from what somebody else might see. I thought it was a really gentle, lovely way of putting it, which is why I thought it was such a good thing to do. Well, I think, um, and the other thing is, I I'm I am half. Um, I my dad's white. My grandma, granddad, aunties, uncles, cousins uh, are Pakia. Um, so you you see both sides of it. Where you know, obviously, some who are just one or the other. Um, don't see things that I pick up on. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was a. It was, I knew it would be a touchy subject, but um, you know, I'm, as I write in the book, I've been in a unique um, position that I'm not sure many international people would have been in. That I've been, uh, I guess, racially not abused. Well, I suppose I have. Um, from well, it's certainly been insensitive. I mean, when you say it like when you when you say what's been said, it's certainly insensitive. Having said that, look, I'd, you know, and, and again, you didn't the way that you put it. I mean, I can I can see these two or these guys more than two saying these things, and I can see them thinking that there's nothing wrong with what they're saying as well. Which is what again I I love about opening the conversation and saying, hey, listen, you know, you got to think bigger than that. Yeah, and I mean, I've heard a lot of. Um you know, positive things from, from it that, you know, that other people are like, oh, I might have said this in the past and um, think twice about doing it. So, as I said, sometimes having uncomfortable conversations uh, is the best thing. So I see it as a positive. Uh, as you said, I've never come, I didn't want to call out people or um, I just wanted to tell my side of the story and um, explain a few things from my eyes. Are you are you happy with the overall book and like and and also how many times have you read it or you had to proofread it or 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 how many times you've gone through those chapters and pages? Oh, it's been a lot. Um, I really enjoyed the process of writing it. Um, the editing side of it, I will not would not uh, miss that one iota. It was uh, it was a t- <laughs> it wasn't enjoyable. It's grueling, um, isn't it? It's bloody no, grueling, no. isn't it? Yeah, but it was. Um, 
I've been obviously going around the country and I was sort of joking that um, if you would have told my English teachers back at high school and <laughs> that, that I'd ever write a book, um, they would have they would have been like, yeah, no chance that Taylor's going to be doing that. But um, no, I'm happy with what it is. And as you said, I mean, the journalists have, have their agendas and go in certain directions, but there's a lot of nice stuff, positive stuff in there that, um, you know, hopefully resonates with um, with the readers. Ross Taylor is with us on the platform. The book is called Black and White. It's been such a monumental part of your life, cricket, isn't it? When you picked up a cricket bat as a kid, did you think it was going to take over to such an extent? Oh, not at all. I, um, I probably, like most kids, uh, loved the game and, and wanted to play for the Central Districts and the Black Caps. Did I ever think I would have the career that I did? I guess you hope. Um, but no, n- never envisaged playing 450 games. Um, wow winning a World Cup, hitting the winning runs, um, and still be playing professional cricket at 38, 39. So, um, no, I'm pretty happy with my achievements, and I guess this book is is to touch on a lot of different areas of me growing up and throughout, but uh, also to thank a lot of people and um, and explain how people have helped me out along the journey as well. Your, your greatest achievements, uh, you know, obviously the World Test Championship. I, I, I also wrote down 100, 100, 100, because when you achieved playing 100 games in all three formats, I was just gobsmacked, mate. I mean, that, that to me was just the first, you know, person on the planet to actually do that. Then, of course, you're 290. So let's talk about the 100, 100, 100. What did that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it was nice to to be the first to do it. I guess I'm fortunate that 2020 was coming through at the beginning of my career. Um but I think there'll be a few more players to do it. I think Coley will do it next week, uh, be the second be the second person to do it. But then I don't think there'll be many um, many more. I think there'll be a few more in the next three or four years. But then after that, with how cricket's going and the landscape's changing, I you know I don't think you know 2020 leagues playing more 2020 internationals less one days, and then obviously some countries um, don't really prioritise tests. So. Um, you know, I think it would be, you know, something that I'm proud of, but something that I think, as I said, probably won't be done by, by many more in the years to come, which would be a bit of a shame for for international cricket. Ross Taylor with us on the platform. The Black Caps winning in the West Indies yesterday, a one-day series for the first time in 37 years. And I was watching that game, Ross, and I was just thinking, wow, one-day cricket, how weird. It just felt weird. And, I mean, it's even weird for me saying that because I love one-day cricket and I grew up on it. But you're so right, aren't you? I just wonder whether or not all three formats can be sustained now because once this T20 league kicks in and you know those calendars and dates are cemented in place, there's so much money generated around that which funds the whole game of cricket. It, it just seems something's got to suffer here. Oh, 100%. And I think um, it's like other international sports, international game is probably going to suffer more. Um, you go through all the countries around the world. New Zealand's probably one of the only ones that doesn't have a... Uh, a competition that's owned by international owners um, and, you know, has an influx of uh, international players playing in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I only played in West Indies once um, in a one-day series. It's just one of those places that you, they seem to always come out to us, but uh, we never really went there, um, which is a little bit disappointing. Um, plus, it's not a bad place to tour when, when, it's, right. uh, when it's cold and that back here in New Zealand, that is for sure. Where was your favourite place to tour? I was just trying to figure out, did you go to South Africa? Did you play over there? You must have, of course. Yeah, made my debut. Um, no, I loved Oh, sorry, it. sorry. It was, yeah, stupid of uh, me, God. It was, a, um, it was, yeah, just, I mean, the way they, a very hard crowd at different places, but hard cricket as well. And, um, you know, went there went there a few times, had an IPL there. Um, and, yeah, I suppose see the country change over over the time when I first went there um, as a school kid. Um, and, you know, I think our last tour there was probably three or four years ago. So Australia, India, I don't know, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, all of these places, a boy from Masterton, mate. I mean, look at the stamps on your passport. Does that, does that blow you away when you stop and think about it? I, got, I went to all of these places and I was playing a game I love while I was doing it. Oh, 100%. I never, you know, I'd say majority of these countries I've travelled to, I never would have gone to had it not been for cricket. Um, but no, I've been fortunate enough to, to go and do some pretty amazing things. Um, you know, fly to a, fly to Taj Mahal in a private jet from our IPL wow. owner, go to Formula One, 
walk the you know walk the grid and spend time in the paddock. All these things I probably didn't take in as much as I should have. I was a bit naive when I was doing it. But something that I look back on was fond memories. The whole captaincy thing, and you go through that in the book as well. Um, how long did it take, and how how easy or not was it for you to? to just put that behind you because you had to come back and play. I know you took a break and and then you came back and played and you scored a century pretty damn quickly. It might have been the first test against the Windies, I think it was. And, but just, I mean, all of that and the way it was handled and the fallout from it and the lies that were told and everything else, how much of a stress and a strain was that to actually be able to all of a sudden go, okay, I've got to bury this because I've got to get on with it? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was a tough process. Uh, I guess first and foremost, you put them you want to play for your country and do that to the best of your ability, then um, you always, I grew up, uh, you know, respecting the elders and um, respecting uh, the people in authority. high places. But, yeah. You know, when, you know, with authority that, but then you, you know, you, you have, you think that these people are trustworthy and you can take them at face value. And um, I learned a tough lesson that that's not quite the case. Um, and yeah, I think, it happened in 2000, end of 2012. I uh, met the publishers back in 2000, mid 2013. Um, when it was happening, Gilbert and Oka, the All Black uh, Mental Schools, uh, I was working with them at the time, and he said, "Ross, um, just remember this. This will be a good book." Wow. Um, so I got it. I got it off my chest um, with the publishers. They held on to it. Um, they. Um, we we did three or four hours a couple of times. Um, it was nice to get it down on paper, and it was you know it was put away. So we we had it there for when we did decide to write a book. It was very therapeutic, and it was nice to get it off my chest. Um, so yeah, I didn't really talk about it with Paul Thomas, the author, very often because he he had twenty five thousand words um, to refer back to and, and write his story. Because one of the things I always loved and admired uh, about you, not only with the cricket bat in your hand, but the amount of interviews that you know we've done over the years and things, is that you were always really honest about it. I could ask you a question. I asked you. I remember asking you about being dropped from the T20 side, and you hadn't been told about it. And you're one of the few players I've met in any kind of professional sport in this country who actually doesn't mind actually saying the truth. You don't come out with the cheesy PR thing that somebody's told you. Was that a conscious decision of yours? Is 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 it always been the way that you've thought? I'm, I I I have to tell what the truth is. Oh, 100%. That's the way I was brought up. And um, I, don't get me wrong, if someone asks you a hairy question, you learn to deal with it. But if you can answer it openly and honestly and not throw your teammates or someone under the bus, then why not tell the truth? What, you've got to, you know, you got to have honesty and integrity um, and not only in your sport, but um, in your life in general and, and live by it. So if someone asks me a question, as long as it's not offending and it's legally okay, I'll mm. give you my opinion. That's so remiss of me, mate. We've been talking for, four, for about 13, 14 minutes. I haven't even asked you about Victoria and about the kids as well. And I just know how important this is to you. And I always love seeing those piggies, especially when the kids are asleep at the cricket. I just love that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> They're all bundled up with their woolly hats on and that fast asleep while you're playing. It's brilliant. It's brilliant, mate. It's, it's, just, it's a real connection. Let me tell you that. Yeah, I mean, um, it's been really good to be home. Uh, my daughter, Mackenzie, play, I watched her play three games of netball um, before I retired, and I watched three in a row. So just those little things that um, you probably, you know, the, the general public don't see um, very often. Um, you know, it's nice to, you know, do normal normal things that you don't get to do when you're playing cricket and, um, and travelling the world, I guess. The 290 in Perth, man, it was 10 short. I know, it's, I mean, it's not 10 short, it's 290 runs. Of course, you've got to look at it like that. But, oh, look, we were all praying and hoping and wanting you to get 300, mate. Yeah, I mean, it was, it is what it is. I sort of, the way I look at it, if you'd said to me at the start of the game, I would have got 290, I would have taken it. But, um, I mean, you look back in hindsight, I tell the story that... Um, I I looked at the scoreboard and I was on 287. Um, but before I looked at the scoreboard, Trent Bolt came up to me and told me to hurry up and get 300 because he's cramping himself. So um, it was nice to, you know, in hindsight, I should have just backed him because, you know, we'd probably put on quite a few runs leading into that. But uh, 290 high score by a visiting batsman in Australia. Um, 
I'll take it. A couple more questions. We'll let you go. And thank you so much for your time. The book is called Black and White. Ross Taylor, legend with us. How do we get more Polynesian players playing, Ross? I had a good interview with um, Dion Nash the other day, and he's uh, set up a cricket uh, wicket and everything else at St. Paul's there in, um, in Pons- uh, Ponsby Grey Lynn in Auckland, and he's got lads playing in a traditional rugby league school, and it's a predominantly um, a brown-faced school. I mean, when I sent when we sent Charlie there, there's only four white boys in the school, and he's got the cricket going there, which is just a wonderful story. How do how do we capitalise this and get and get more and more Polynesian girls and boys playing? Because physically, they're just at their absolute. You know, the you know the big strapping coming down there with the ball hearing it down be fantastic to see. A hundred percent. But um, yeah, I think it was something that I tried to do, but um, it's just a little. I guess better late than never, but uh, you know New Zealand cricket have got a big push. After I retired, to um, there's a Pacific Island working group to to try and w- work out different ways of promoting the game. I thought it might have been good when I was playing, and they could actually relate to me playing yeah. in the New Zealand team. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a push to improve that. I think with all the meetings we've had so far, it's it's been very positive, and a couple of things that have come from it is um, obviously it's an expensive game. Um, trying to, you know, just trying to break down some of those barriers uh, to entry, um, and and cricket's a is quite a time-consuming sport, and I think once we can get the parents and um, you know a lot of these uh, island and Maori kids, they see a, a pathway and a and a living um, going along the rugby and rugby league route, where um, you know with a few of the conversations we've been having. Um, you know, the parents don't see a, a pathway to, to earning a living with cricket. So there is definitely a, you know, an education in that regard. But um, hopefully we can just some, encourage them to play the game. Um, and there's definitely some talented athletes out there that would make a good lock or number eight. Um, you know, they could also come in and smack the ball a mile and bowl 140 in yeah. um, the Black Hats. And, and I hope in, in years to come. Just uh, quickly on that before we finish, look, uh, you know, you know, we say it's an expensive game, but then I look at India and, and, you know, I look at beach cricket and I look at backyard cricket, mate, all you need is three sticks, don't you, and a ball. I mean, it's like rugby. You can play in bare feet, mate, all summer. That's, I mean, that's that's the other side of it. Well, 100%, and that's something that I did. Um, and, you know, just, I suppose, with the event of all the technology and iPads and, and cell phones, um, getting outside and just being active. Um, playing cricket, backyard cricket for hour upon hour. Um, you know, hopefully that's not lost in, in the years to come either. Finally, you got a real job, mate. What are you doing? Yeah, I, um, I'm working two days a week at um, uh, Castle Point. It's a, um, they run a three funds in uh, in Auckland, uh, in Australian and New Zealand equities. So I'm a pro- uh, I'm a client relationship manager, and I'm really I've enjoyed it. I've um, I can still play cricket when it's around, but I'm learning learning the business and, and meeting a lot of new people that um, obviously some know cricket, but some people have no idea who I am. So um, no, I'm I'm looking forward to that side of um, not being involved in, in cricket. I'll be involved in cricket, I guess, all my life in different capacities. But I'm looking forward to the new chapter, um, and it's been amazing and a lot of fun so far. All the very best, mate. Um, thank you so much again for spending so much time with us. I've just just absolutely loved uh, yakking to you over the years. Um, you've made us so proud as a player and everything else, but you're just such a good bugger, Ross, which is the most important thing of all. Thank you so much, mate. Uh, thanks for having me, Mother.